Hello everybody, today we're going to study counterexamples. We'll be working on these specific types of problems and working on some vocabulary concepts also. A conditional statement is a statement that can be equivalently written as an if-then statement. We call the part that comes after the word if the hypothesis and the part that comes after the word then will refer to that as the conclusion. To say that a conditional statement is true means that it is always true. And if a conditional statement is only true in some cases, then we would consider it to be false. However, just because a statement is false doesn't mean that it's never true. And so we want to be able to tell the difference between these three cases. Again, when we say that a conditional statement is true, it means that every time the hypothesis is true, the conclusion is also true. If a conditional statement is only true in some cases, as we said, then it's false. So if there are some cases of the hypothesis where the conclusion is not true, then that statement is considered false. And as we said, just because it's false doesn't mean that it's never true. And so false conditional statements can sometimes be true. Now, a counterexample is a case of a conditional statement where we can show that the hypothesis is true, but the conclusion is false. And this is a big idea for us to be able to disprove conditional statements and tell whether or not they're false. So these problems that follow are an exercise in critical thinking. It's important not only to prove that things are true, but also to be able to show why a mathematical statement is false. So let's take this example. We have the if-then statement. If two numbers have opposite signs, then their sum is zero. The hypothesis would be this part after the word if, that would be two numbers have opposite signs. And the conclusion will be the part after the word then, which is their sum is zero. Now think about this. Is this statement true or false? Is it always true? Is it never true? Is it sometimes true? This statement is false. And it is not always true. Is it never true? Well, it's also not never true. Because sometimes it is true. And we have to be able to tell the difference between these ideas. Okay? So, as I said, just because this statement is false doesn't mean that it's never true. And so we want to be able to tell the difference between these ideas so that we can get the meaning of what these conditional statements actually are trying to say. This statement is trying to say that just because two numbers have opposite signs, that one is positive and one is negative, that it means that they have to add up to zero. Now, let's try a sample problem here. If the statement is true, select the statement is true. And if the statement is not true, then provide a counterexample. So consider this statement again. If two numbers have opposite signs, then their sum is zero. Okay, I could leave this problem blank for you and just make it free response and tell you to give me an example. And in that case, you would have to come up with two numbers that do have opposite signs, but that have a sum which is not equal to zero. So again, you'd be looking for two numbers where one's positive and one's negative, and when you add them up, you get a result that is not zero. So it probably wouldn't take you too long to think about such a pair of numbers. And if you focus, you might have an idea that you could think of right now. One such pair of numbers could be positive 3 and negative 7. Okay, this number is positive and this number is negative. So they do have opposite signs, so these two numbers satisfy the hypothesis. But if I add them up, I get negative 4, and negative 4 is not 0. And so we've shown that this is a case where the hypothesis is true, but the conclusion is false. And so 3 and negative 7 create what is called a counterexample. 
the way that I created these problems to be multiple choice is basically a way for you to be able to do some critical thinking and understand the vocabulary that we're developing. In this case, I'm working with some terms that I think you guys already understand, such as opposite sign, positive and negative numbers, right? And the idea of numbers adding up to zero or not. So, in this case, like we said, this statement is true sometimes, but overall, it's not a true statement. It's not always true. If we look at the first example for A, we could consider four and negative four. These numbers do have opposite signs. So this shows that the hypothesis is true in this case for A. And if I add them up, four and negative four do make zero. So we would call this for A, we would call that an example. This is not a counterexample. In this case, what we have is an example where this statement is actually true. And as we said, it's only sometimes true. And this would be one of those cases where it's true. Now we can take a look at B, where it says a triangle and a circle. This would be a non-example, okay? A triangle and a circle are not numbers, nor do they have opposite signs. So in this case, we would call this a non-example, okay? A counter-example has to at least make the hypothesis true. And so since this has nothing to do with our hypothesis, with the part after the words if, that means that we have a non-example, okay? This is irrelevant to this specific statement that we're talking about here. Now it brings us to option C, and we have these two numbers that have opposite signs, like 2 and negative 5. These two numbers do have opposite signs, so again, this makes the hypothesis true, and if we were to add these up, we would see that they make a result of negative 3. 2 plus negative 5 makes negative 3 and that is not equal to zero. So C would be a counterexample because this shows that just because the hypothesis is true doesn't mean that this conclusion also has to be true, right? This has shown that it's false. And so what you would want to select on this problem is C as your correct answer. C would be the right answer because that is the counterexample. Okay, again, a true statement has no counterexamples. So if this statement was true, we would not be able to find a counterexample to it. Here's some vocabulary that we're covering during this section of the test, and this is important for you to understand. And we could discuss some of these terms in more detail. And this would be a good place for you to maybe take a screenshot of this video and write some notes to understand that these are terms that we've already been using for a while and that if you're a little unfamiliar with some of these that you should familiarize yourself with all of these terms. Okay, again, here's another table that has some important vocabulary that we've been using. The idea of a quadratic polynomial, a quadratic function, as opposed to a linear polynomial or a linear function. Okay, so these words are something that we're trying to master by using these critical thinking exercises that we're jumping into with this practice set. So here's a list of all the vocabulary that might pop up in this section. You should be aware of the definitions of all of these and you should be familiar with using them. We use these to solve lots of problems that we got to all over our exams and on our homework assignments. So these are the building blocks of our vocabulary when we're talking about this concept of quadratic functions. So we'll be working on these during this practice set. Okay, you cannot truly learn vocabulary by just memorizing definitions. You have to use these words to figure out how they work. And so it's important for you to actually get this exercise and I think this can be helpful for students to make sure that you understand what's happening with these vocabulary words and how they all relate to each other. So let's do some examples and we'll practice. We would want 
to read the directions that would be an important thing in any problem. And we understand that this tells us that if the following statement is true, you would select the statement is true. Otherwise, you want to select a counter example. So we want to make this fact clear. So the idea that we're dealing with, again, is if you can look at this statement and know that it's true, maybe you have some kind of feeling and you know that this is obvious to you because you've heard this over and over again. Maybe we've discussed it. That's one way to do these problems. Honestly, I always tell students to follow their instincts. But if your instincts are not totally confident on this specific problem or on, or on one of these specific problems, then what you should do is use process of elimination and make sure that you can think about each one. So let's look at the hypothesis. Okay, the hypothesis is this part right here. It says, if a quadratic function has only one x-intercept, so what we want to do is make sure that any option that we would choose here would be a quadratic function, f of x, and that it would have only one x-intercept. So if we look at option b, for instance, we can see that this is a linear function. It's not a quadratic function. So that would mean that we would cross this out. Likewise, we see on c that this is not a quadratic function either. This is a cubic function. And so we can cross this out also. Okay, so these are two different non-examples. And those are things that we want to have help us here to narrow down our possible responses. So now we have to choose between either A or D. And I can promise you that at least on these problems, if the statement is not true, then there will be a counterexample here. And if the statement is true, then that'll mean that there is no possible counterexample, and so everything will be able to be eliminated one way or another. Now, if we were to graph option D, if we were to graph this specific parabola, we would be able to tell that the vertex that we have here, because we're looking at vertex form, that the vertex would be with the x-coordinate of negative 4 and a y-coordinate of 0. And so as we talked about how counterintuitive it was for this to be a positive 4 here, but this term to be a negative 4, we can't lose sight of that fact um, because it could be an easy way to lose a point. So we know that this is our vertex. So that means that I would take four steps to the left and that I could put my vertex right there. And now we understand that this would be a positive parabola, right? This would be a happy face parabola because we have no leading negative, right? Our coefficient here is an invisible one. And so that means that we have a parabola that's going to be open upward. So now we could draw a parabola the way that we usually would. I want to emphasize I'm going through this slower than would be usual for a test where you guys would have time and you would probably be thinking faster than this. I'm trying to cover every detail. So let's take a look at what we just drew. We drew a quadratic function that has only one x-intercept. Okay, we can see that the vertex of this red function of this parabola, its vertex is on the x-axis. And therefore, this is not a counterexample. This is an example because it makes not only the hypothesis true, but it also makes the conclusion true. So we would consider this to be an example, not a counterexample. And so again, like we said, if a statement is true, that means that I can't possibly think of a counterexample for it because they don't exist. And that's the situation that's happening on this problem, is that this statement is true. And because this was an example and not a counterexample, that means we can eliminate this possibility also. And you would be only left with the possibility that the statement is true.
If you think about this further, it should make sense, right? That if a quadratic function has only one x-intercept, right? That must mean that that's the place where it crosses, okay? A quadratic function either has one x-intercept, it has no x-intercepts, or it has two x-intercepts. Maybe it crosses in two different places, as in this example. So we'd have to consider how that would look and drawing a picture would be a great way to make sure that you're thinking about this correctly and again doing critical thinking trying to find some evidence for your claim so for the second example we have let's take a look at number three here We should again see the hypothesis asks for a quadratic function that has a vertex, which means that we should be eliminating anything that doesn't make the, the hypothesis true, okay? So again, option A is not a quadratic function. We see the biggest exponent here is a 3. So this is a cubic function. So we would call this a non-example. So we'll cross that out. Okay, it looks like we don't have any other non-examples up here. So we'll have to do more critical thinking. Okay, it would be nice if you could just look at this and actually know that it's false. And one reason why you should be able to tell this very quickly is that we've been studying vertex form in great depth. Okay, we know that we can draw the vertex of a parabola to be anywhere. When we graph it, we can just adjust these values and we can get the vertex to move around as we did on Desmos. And this statement, we don't want to be confused about what it means. Okay, as I said, an if-then statement, when it makes a claim, it is claiming to always be true, right? This equation, this, uh, this equation that we have right here, kind of already shows that this is not always true because we know the vertex of this parabola would be at negative 4 and positive 2. Not at the point 3, negative 5. And so I would be hoping that you would read that and automatically reading this sentence say, you know what, this cannot be true. We graph parabolas everywhere, up, down, left, right, we move them every direction you could imagine. And so we know that they don't always have to have a vertex in one specific location. But I could understand that some of you guys might be confused and say, well, it's true in this case. Isn't it true in this case, right? The coordinates of the vertex of this equation right here would be positive 3, and negative 5. That would be the vertex of this equation. And so think about what that means. This means that option B is a quadratic function that has a vertex and it has a vertex that must be at the point 3, negative 5. And so we should see that this is not a non-example, not a counter-example, but just an example. It's an example where the conclusion and the hypothesis are both true. And so in this case, we would not want to select that. As we said, for a conditional statement to be true, it must always be true, which would mean that every single quadratic function that has a vertex has to have a vertex that is at this point. And that's false. And as we saw earlier, C would be our counterexample. And that's the selection that we should make here. So as I said, drawing a picture and eliminating other possibilities are one way to do these problems. But 
it is essential that you understand the actual vocabulary because if you don't know the words that you're dealing with, it's going to be practically impossible to find evidence one way or the other. So here would be a good place for you to make a decision. You could take a little think time. You could pause this video if you're working at home. And we would see that in this case, if a function of f of x is a quadratic function, well, that means that we should cross out anything that's not a quadratic function. And in this case, we have a, which is not a quadratic function. We have d, which is not a quadratic function. And so both of these would be non-examples. All right? Well, what about C and B now? We broke it down to a 50-50, and we have to make a decision. Well, we can see, okay, B is a quadratic function, and is to the largest exponent of any variable in this equation. Okay, we see that this 2x has an invisible 1. That's the exponent there. Usually we don't write it when it's a 1. And so the largest exponent is a 2. And so we see that option B does make the hypothesis true, but it also makes the conclusion true. And because of that, we call this an example. Okay, it's not a counterexample, but just an example. And so we can cross this one out also. And that leaves us with the possibility, the only possibility that the statement is true. Okay, and this was one of the most important definitions and hopefully you can tell that I'm trying to get you to understand the definition of what a quadratic function is because we've been using this as the hypothesis in practically all of these examples. Well, now you can see in this example we have a hypothesis that's a little more complicated than just being a quadratic function. Now it has to be one that has a vertex above the x-axis. So in this case, there's no easy non-examples that we can eliminate just because they're not quadratics. We don't have any cubics or linear functions to eliminate. But we should continue reading because, again, the hypothesis is everything that comes after the word if and everything that's before the word then. So we have to think about all of this. So not just that it's a quadratic function, but that it has a vertex above the x-axis. So I see that we have a few different vertices here, right? The vertex of this equation is going to be above the x-axis because that's positive. The vertex of this parabola will be above the x-axis because that's positive. But the vertex of this one will be below the x-axis because it's negative. And this might lead some of you guys to say, oh, okay, that's the counterexample. But that's not the way this works, okay? Again, to prove this statement false, we have to show that when this hypothesis is true, that the conclusion is not true. So again, on option A, we have this is a non-example, okay? This example right here is irrelevant because its vertex is not above the x-axis. It would be below the x-axis. So now we got to continue thinking. We know that our option would either be C or B. So now let's consider what's happening here. We can think about maybe actually drawing a graph and trying to tell whether or not it would have an x-intercept and try to investigate that a little more. So here we go. We draw our x-y-axis and we think about where these vertices would be. Okay, if I was to draw this one, we would have a vertex that would be at negative 3 and positive 3, right? Because we know we have to change the sign of this value in the parentheses to get our x-coordinate. So that means that I would take three steps left and three steps up and that my vertex would be right here. 
also think to yourself, would option C, would this one be a happy face parabola or a sad parabola? Because the leading coefficient is positive because we don't see a negative here that's an invisible one, that means we would have a happy face parabola. And that means that we would be going upward like this. Okay, and we could consider the idea that this parabola, this quadratic function, only has one turning point, and we call this turning point the vertex. And so since we know it's not going to be able to turn back around again, we know that this is never going to go back downward and cross the x-axis. And again, the x-intercept would be the place where the graph crosses the x-axis. So we can see this graph is not going to cross it. So what does that mean? Did we find a counterexample? Or did we just find an example? So because option C makes the hypothesis true and the conclusion true, again, this one does not have an x-intercept. We have just found an example, not a counterexample. And therefore, we would not want to choose this one. So now we should look at option B and consider what this means. Well, this function has a negative, a leading negative coefficient. And so that would give us a sad face parabola. And it would have the same vertex, right? The vertex of this parabola would be negative 3 because we have to change the sign of this value to get the x coordinate. And then our y coordinate would be positive 3. So again, we have the same exact vertex as last time except now it's going to be open downward, right? We're going to have our sad face parabola. And we know that since this is going downward from here, it's definitely going to cross the x-axis. And in this case, we don't have to even calculate where it would be that it crosses it. We know that it's going to cross it. It's going in that direction. And so therefore, we've shown that this red parabola that I just graphed, a b, has a vertex above the x-axis, right? Right there, this vertex is above. But this red parabola does have an x-intercept. And therefore, we've shown that this statement is false. And so we just found the counterexample. So you would pick option B. Okay? And again, because a true statement can never have a counterexample. We know that this statement is definitely not true. And that is the way we need to think about these problems. So let's do another example. And hopefully you can become more independent on these problems. I'm hoping that it starts to make more sense. And also, I'm hoping that some of this vocabulary is becoming more familiar to us as we use it. So if a quadratic function has a vertex above the x-axis, then it must have an x-intercept. Let's think about what that means. Is there anything that we can eliminate here? Again, we want to make sure we find anything that's a non-example and eliminate that possibility because we're looking for counter-examples. Not examples, and we're not looking for non-examples either. We don't want to find an example, and we don't want to find a non-example. So which one of these would have a vertex that is not above the x-axis? Because then we could cross that out. Maybe you can make that determination right now on your own. Try to make a decision. Which one has a vertex that is not above the x-axis? And I'm hoping you can see that because these two values are positive, these would have a vertex that is above the x-axis. Again, this is vertex form for these two possibilities. However, this one's also in vertex form. And since we see that this number is a negative 3, we know that this vertex would be below the x-axis. And therefore, we can eliminate it because it is not above the x-axis, which means this would be a non-example. This one would be irrelevant to our discussion. So now what we want to do is consider options B and D and determine what we would do. Okay, which one of these must have an x-intercept, okay? Is there one that does have one and one that doesn't? Because we, that might help us find our counterexample. So again, you could draw a graph and you could do a quick sketch to make a decision here. 
and we see our vertex on this would again be negative 3 and positive 3. And so if we go left 3 and up 3, that's our vertex. Okay. I guess we could graph this one in blue. We'll graph this one right here in blue and let's see what happens. Okay. That would be a sad face parabola, right? Because we have this leading negative sign that tells us that we're going to have this open downward, not upward. So, does this one have an x-intercept? This has two x-intercepts that we can see. We know it's going to cross the x-axis in two places. So, we just found an example, right? Option B shows that this part is true, right? It has a vertex above the x-axis, but it also has an x-intercept. And so this is one that we can eliminate right away. We can think about that. Well, now let's graph this one in red and see what this one does, okay? And this one coincidentally has the same vertex, right? Negative 3, positive 3. That would be our vertex here. And because there's no leading negative, because this is an invisible one right there, that means that this would be a happy face parabola. And so we have this shape that we're looking at. And we can see that this red parabola is not going to cross the x-axis. No matter how far we keep going up, these parabolas are never going to turn around again. And so, in this case, we see we've shown that just because this vertex is above the x-axis doesn't mean that it has to have an x-intercept. Right? In this case, we don't have an x-intercept. And so we've chosen our correct counterexample, which would be D. This would be the answer that you want to pick. Option D. So you can continue working on these examples and thinking about how to make them smaller, how to eliminate the possibilities that are non-examples, and then little by little you can graph them, you can think about them, you can test the idea whether or not they're true. And that will give you an idea by looking at a picture, by making some kind of judgment there about which one you should choose, whether or not the statement is true. So think about this one. Which, can, which one can we eliminate? You should try that on your own. Okay, again, this one says that a quadratic function f of x is a vertex below the x-axis. So since that's our hypothesis, we should eliminate anything that has a vertex that's above the x-axis. And that means that we should get rid of A and C. Because both of these have a positive 3, which means the y-coordinate of the vertex is positive, and that it would be above the x-axis, not below the x-axis, as our hypothesis says. So, and now we're looking for something that does not have an x-intercept. So that's what we want to make a judgment on right now. Does this parabola, if I graphed it, would this have an x-intercept? Well, let's see. Okay, our statement again is saying that if its vertex is below, then it does not have an x-intercept. Okay, that's what we want to make clear. It's saying that it does not have one. Well, if we do this vertex, again, we can see that we would change that positive 3 to a negative 3, and that our y-coordinate would be negative 3. In this case, we notice that this sign is changing, but this one does not change from vertex form. And so that means that I would go left three steps, down three steps, and that would be my vertex. And if we were to graph this again, this would be a happy face parabola, so we know it's going to be concave up, okay? then that means that we have a shape that looks like this. And we know that it is going to cross the x-axis. It's going to cross the x-axis in two places. And it's pretty obvious that it will. And so, again, this statement said that if the vertex is below, then it does not have an x-intercept. But this one does have an x-intercept. And therefore, this is our counter example. Okay, so it's hard to tell what's going on in your head, 
And so a lot of this has to go on while you're drawing lines and considering, following your instincts and actually trying to make a judgment and trying to use critical thinking skills. It's important that you try these on your own and actually do some work memorizing this vocabulary, familiarizing yourself with it. And this is why we're going to practice speaking in class as well as writing because these vocabulary words are important. All right? It's part of the understanding that we're trying to build. So if we see if a function is f of x is a quadratic function, we can take a look and see if there's anything that's not a quadratic function. And we see on option A, this is not quadratic. This is a linear function. And so this one would be a non-example, and we could eliminate that. Okay? And now, after all the work that we've done, we can see that, you know, you should realize by now that the graph of a quadratic function is called a parabola. This is not the first time that we've heard this. Okay? And we have several different forms to graph them. And in this case, we're looking at the vertex form. And because we've been looking at the vertex form, we know we can move this around our graph up, down, left, and right. And we can also reflect it over the x-axis. We should have a feeling about this already. Okay, we've seen this idea when it says that it must have an x-intercept. We know that that's not true all the time. Okay, but let's say that you weren't sure about that. Let's say for some reason you were like, you know what, I'm not sure. I want to make sure that I'm sure. Okay, you're not sure whether you should eliminate this or not. Maybe you think you should eliminate it, but you're like, wait, I'm not sure. In that case, you go look at the other two possibilities and think about what would happen. I mean, right now would be a great place to pause the video and you graph these two and tell me which one of these would be a counterexample. Only one of them can be a counterexample and the other one would probably be either an example or a non-example, and you have to make that determination on your own. So we can see that I did give you these two parabolas, both have the same vertex. Even though this has a leading negative, their vertex is in the same exact place, right? This negative two means that the x coordinate would be positive two, and this negative five means that the y coordinate would still be negative five. And so that means I could go right two, and then down five steps, and plot my vertex right there. Okay? We can see that this negative one, let's do that one in blue, okay? This one right here would be a sad face because of that leading negative. So we can draw a parabola pretty quickly and think about that. Okay, would that have an x-intercept? We can see, wait a minute that would not have an x-intercept. And if there's time ticking on the clock, then you could choose D and you could say, hey, wait a minute, we just disproved it. This is a counterexample. We already found it. But if you weren't totally sure, maybe you could double check with B and make sure that this isn't a counterexample and you didn't make some kind of mistake. Okay, because this one does not have a negative in front, we know this would be a happy face. And because, like we said, they both have the same vertex, right? That negative 2 is going to change into a positive 2 and that negative 5 would stay in negative 5, this means that we have a parabola that's open upward. And we can see that this one will have two x-intercepts. And notice that it says it must have an x-intercept. So what did we just find in option B? Is this a counterexample or an example? Okay, this would be an example, not a counterexample. Okay, this is an example because this is a quadratic function, right? And it does have an x-intercept. So this would be our example, not a counterexample, and so we could not select that. And as we said, we should understand, you know, this statement is true sometimes. Yes, sometimes a quadratic function does have an x-intercept, but sometimes it doesn't. And that's why we have to be precise with our mathematical language so that we don't accidentally say something that's false. So in this case, D would be your counterexample. And as we said, when a statement is true, there are no counterexamples. So option D is what we should select here. So... 
I hope that this was helpful. I hope you guys learned something about counterexamples here. And this form of problem will be around for a while. We'll be using this to test the vocabulary and make sure we understand it. So I would definitely become familiar with it. It's one way that I test vocabulary and critical thinking skills at the same time. So I wish you luck studying. Good luck.